Welcome to the Woven Energy Podcast on Real Practical Shamanism. Joseph Sarkar here. Damon is away this week, so I thought I would take this opportunity to compile a bit of a a bit of a best of collection of clips from our previous episodes, or Damon's greatest hits, so to speak. I wanted to do this because as there's over 60 odd hours of deep dive shamanic goodness here on this podcast, uh, there may have been moments that you missed that were perhaps hidden away at the ends of episodes. Um, I also wanted to give our our new listeners something nice and accessible to just listen to and see what we're all about here at Woven Energy. So I hope you like them. And if you check the information box in your podcast app, I will put the episodes in there, which I used to make the clips. So if you want to go ahead and check out those full episodes, you can uh, you can see which episodes they are down in that information box. You can support us over at patreon.com slash woven energy for extra bits and bobs. And without any further ado, please enjoy this collection of best moments from the Woven Energy podcast on shamanism. Uh, shamanism was designed to deal with the situation where very, very small groups of, you know, maybe 10 to 14 people are moving around in a big, wide, frankly, fairly dangerous world. Um, and they they don't have a very much of a safety net uh, to fall back on. So decisions had to be made um, by the shamans who were the strategic leaders of the group. Not necessarily later on, they weren't necessarily the actual chieftain, although it seems that very early on the, the chieftain and the shaman were one and the same thing and that this sort of diverged at a later time, possibly with the introduction of pastoralism. But mm. the, the, the role of the shaman was to support, protect, care for the, the group as a whole. In order to do that, the shaman took on um, a very, very, very close relationship with nature. The shaman learned uh, th through a process um, to shut down the normal um, uh, categorization and uh, filtering that the brain does to sensory information in order to help us to simplify things, to make things easier to remember. The shaman would learn to shut that down in order to see nature much more directly, uh, to see it in an unfiltered way. And the shaman would use a, a wide variety of different techniques. Um, one would be Arum Shitayan Amtan, which, for instance, which is to take on um, the, the sense of an animal, of a wild animal. Um, or, or famously, there are there are psychoactive substances that were used by shamans for similar kind of purposes. Mm -hmm. um, but effectively, what the shaman was doing was ridding himself of the miasma, ridding himself of his social conditioning, of the, his judgments, of his um, categorizations, of his cultural biases. Cultural biases, exactly. And uh, but at every level, I don't just mean in his mind. I mean in his spirit, in his body, in in all ways. And having achieved that state taking nature unfiltered and experiencing it unfiltered. So when he came back from that state, he had he picked up on very often very, very subtle cues within nature, complex, rich cues within natural patterns that the members of the tribe themselves may not be able to pick up on. And it gave him a kind of strategic advantage. He just knew in his bones that, for instance, it might be better to go to one place rather than another um, in order to survive the winter, for instance. It would be um, a feeling, right? It wouldn't yeah, be like... it, it's, it's shamanistic. Shamanistic technique is, is experiential. Um, yeah. It all, it all, but it, true shamanistic technique always has a purpose it's not undirected it's it's a very very directed thing and i think this is one of the things that gets missed uh when talking about shamanism shamanism in a theoretical sense i mean i studied shamanism at university as well as as practicing it um practicing it um and it's very, very easy to get caught up in the phenomenology of shamanism. So, for instance, we could describe the differences uh, between the shamans of, of Mongolia and the shamans of Siberia. Um, but actually, they've, those, they've got so much in common that the differences are almost almost unworth, dis not worth discussing. 
um, they're so trivial. But in a in a academic setting, you have to pick up on something. You have to describe something. If you're not practicing, um, you're seeing shamanism from the outside in and not from the inside out. When you see it from the inside out, you start to realize that it is it is one thing. And I think you said. Um, when when you look at a map of the world and you see, for instance, the major religions, they often color in different patches of the world in different mm. colors. Um, so I guess you would say most of Europe would be, say, red for Christianity, something like that. And and it shows you how cultures spread. Cultures spread from person to person. But when you take yeah, it shout- spread from an idea, right? Spread from yeah, ideas, yeah, from one right. person t- giving somebody a piece of information to another person. But when you take yep. shamanism, again, difference between shamanism and other inverted commas religions is that it doesn't mm-hmm. look like that at all. It looks like somebody's taken the world and lightly sprinkled it with a pepper pot. There's not much shamanism yeah. anywhere in the world, but what there is is scattered all over the places. It's in South America, it's in North America, it's in Siberia, it's in you know Africa, ev- everywhere all over the gro- globe. You'll find little mm-hmm. pockets of shamanism. And apart from the phenomenology, apart from those little things, you know, what do they make their little their little trinkets out of? Actually, it's all the same, all the same. I think it's it's worth um, readdressing uh, the word spirit in English. Spirit is, as, as I think we've said a few times now, English is not the greatest language for talking about shamanism, uh, shamanistic ideas, shamanistic understanding. Now that's because we English English developed relatively recently as a language. And um, we, what I found in in my time with shamanism is I, I, I even today, the the language does not afford me the the richness um, of expression or the the granularity of expression that I need really to talk about. So this is, I guess, the word chalicity. Um, as we go through these podcasts, people have probably come across a few more words that we've. Mm. that we use that are not really english words they're, uh, wor- they're words that you've come up with yourself and they are the words that best describe what not, you know in not languages. because i particularly like the inventing words but because the english language doesn't afford a word for these things yeah. so so in terms of the word spirit um i would i would guess in the development of the english language that actually i would guess that comes from the norman french it could be wrong it may be anglo-saxon but it's 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 the closest thing we've got to to a number of if if we were to take a a, a shamanistic society, the Mongol society, for instance, um, there are an awful lot of Mongol words that could end up translated into English as spirit. Actually, that's also true in Chinese um, as well. So, uh, if if I give you know we, we've mentioned tengar. Um, which is the the creative aspect um, of the uh, the underlies nature that that word the, the, the upper world in yeah that's well it's, it's, the, the world. it's this again here we're back on this word yeah, no. it's not the upper world it's the spirit of the upper world yeah the, the spirit ah, see, yeah. To, yeah but but that word tengar in in Mongol is is used very widely um it's it's similar in in meaning to the Chinese shen um, or the Japanese kami. Um, it's effectively if if you think of the universe uh, or the the world as if if you take it as an analogy, imagine that was light, then tenga would be the light bulb, the thing that's shining out the world, if you like into mm-hmm. into a manifest reality the um so so there's one word so there's one word that could be translated as a spirit but then there's a there's a something in in human beings uh that that gives rise to the intention of a human being it gives rise to the intention or motivation or, or the impetus to a human being's actions, to a human being, the way that a human being interacts with the world. 
and in Mongol that would that would have a, a actually one of several, but it, it it could have a completely separate word like setel, um, or in Chinese that would be xin, or in Japanese kokoro, um, and again, it's a completely separate word in the the Mongol language from tengar, but because English isn't very good for talking about this stuff. Here we are again, spirit. You know, you, you, you talk about the human spirit. So we, we're using the word spirit as a catch-all. Um, and then there's, there's the spirit, um, as I said, gives rise to this, I, I think I mentioned Zorat, this the intention of, of a human being. Um, and that intention is what drives the is what drives the um, the vitality um, within. We talked about Ashtim, the vitality within a human being to to form their actions, to form the things that they do, to, to form their life effectively, like 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 a flowing river mm-hmm. that, that results in the the entire pattern of actions that really that, that effectively is that person's life. Um, so Ashtim in in Mongol. There's another word we could translate as spirit in English, um, mm. and and you know I'm I'm using these as examples. I'm afraid the list goes on and on and on, um, and this is because we are not a shamanistic society. Therefore, and not only are we not a shamanistic society, we're a society that's been through a history that tended to suppress that kind mm. of activity at at every level, at a, a legal um, level, at a um, at the level of um, uh, physical suppression, um, but also at a cultural level. And so our language has developed to support our historical culture relatively recently, um, and that culture is, as a matter of fact, not a shamanistic, animistic culture. It's it's been a, a culture based on exotericism. Um, mm. I mean, up to about 100 years ago, ours was a culture based mainly on exotericism. So somebody just venturing into the world of shamanism and animism, what's the one piece of advice you could give them to help or guide them to basically not mess up? Yeah, so to not mess up the... We've talked about, you know, I'm just going to go on about Chalisti again, Joe, you know that. Yeah, yeah. But maybe I'll give you a different take on it, okay? A different take on it. Um. Animals tend to be afraid of fire, and there's very good reason for that. It's adaptive. Um, lightning strikes um, caused fires in in the earliest times, millions and millions and millions of years ago. They have throughout the, throughout the history of life on Earth, probably certainly life on the land. And so, fire fire kills animals. It does. It kills them. Um, you know, whole forests get burned down. You know, grasslands and, mm. and animals die in that. So it's naturally adaptive to um to for animals to be scared of fire now um shamans uh, when they came along shamans through their their interest not just not just in animism but beyond animism and what goes on under the the metaphorical bonnet of nature shamans come to an understanding of that the nature is all about change uh, nature is all about energy changes um and it's a continuous change. So what you would say is a shaman sees nature not as a bunch of little boxes and categories, but they, they learn to see it as a, as a process of energy change. The early human shamans, you know, among these hunter, hunter-gatherer societies, you know, from Australopithecus, this, this was way before we ever became Homo sapiens, if, if we want to use those, those labels. Yep. Um, they were afraid of fire too. They were absolutely terrified of it, just like every other, just about every other animal on the on the surface of the land. Um, but they understood that fa- through their through their uh, experimentation, going beyond re- be- that that involvement and reverence with nature that is animism, going beyond that, they they understood that um, that 
the universe is about change. And they saw, just like they saw in the dogs, a kindred spirit, they saw in the fire a kindred spirit because fire is nothing other than an energy change. It's a very, very powerful and dangerous energy change, but it's an energy change. And so, of course, where all the other animals are running away from the fire, the shamans were drawn towards it. They probably were pretty scared of it, you know, but they, they overcame their fear because they realized that understanding reality, understanding in, in the mind and the spirit and the body all at the same time, you know the way that shamans understand things. Understanding reality is also important. They put themselves in a place where they tested themselves. Can we go into this place where there is a real danger, i.e. dealing with this fire stuff, um, and can we... Can we use our shamanistic powers, our shamanistic skills? Is our shamanism powerful enough to overcome that? That's them putting themselves on the line. That's them testing themselves. Yeah, mm. that's them. They're not just sitting around believing that they are mighty over fire because they would have ended up toast, wouldn't they? But it's it, coming back to a different way of looking at chalisti. Chalisti is about. I don't know. I hate to use that that phrase keep it real um <laughs> a friend of ours uses that yeah. but um <laughs> but but really that the the advice is don't lose your connection to reality in fact go further than that rejoice in your connection to reality um shamanism is not about meditating away to some imaginary palace in the clouds and 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 becoming aloof from human society and, and imagining weird and wonderful things. It's the exact opposite of that. You want to get closer to reality. You want to get much closer to what's real than somebody who is a member of a settled and civilized society. You definitely don't want to move in the other direction and get even more kind of unreal, if you see mm -hmm. what I mean. So my advice would be keep looking at what you're doing, keep checking testing even yourself you remember i talked about that. i'm not i'm not advocating the wild run okay <laughs> but maybe testing yourself in more lightweight ways than that but just if you know what i'm talking about when we talked about the wild run that's a great example of me testing myself does my shamanism does my animism actually work or am i just imagining it i don't recommend testing yourself in any situation like that that's potentially lethal um but I'm using that as an extreme example of something where you can do it in much more lightweight ways. You you need to keep looking at yourself, and and if you've got a guide, if you've got a teacher, they will keep you on this anyway. If if they if they're worth their salt, basically, they will keep yeah. you on this anyway. That's the blessing of having a guide. But keep looking at yourself and saying, "Am I imagining in this? Am I making this all up? Or is this something tangible? Is this something real? Is this something I can do things with?" Can, can I do stuff with my shamanism? Um, does my animism contribute to to my life? Does my shamanism contribute to the lives of the people around me? Does it really, empirically, in fact, not in imagination, not in some some baseline ratiocination, you know, in the roots of the tree? Uh, does it does it really, in actual fact, contribute positively? If you're talking about shamanism to the lives of the people around you, if you're talking about animism to your life, we we could I guess we could call it the three pillars of chalicity. So we can break chalicity up into three pillars or three components. Um, in 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 Mongol in Mongol the first one's called bat, and in English I know you've you've got a term for this called paragality as well. Yeah. So. Should we should we talk about the three pillars of chalicity a bit and sure. see if we can put so, them into context? Bat, Toshaltin and Guchuch are the the three components. I, I, I'm not so sure about pillars, because pillars mm -hmm. pillars suggest it's more like chalicity itself. Ch chalicity is a pillar. Yeah. Ch chalicity is a pillar in the structure that is shamanism. Man, I just a, thought it sounded cool. Yeah, it did sound <laughs> cool, yeah. But <laughs> chalicity itself is definitely a pillar. Yeah. It, if you think of of, of of shamanism as having a structure, then chalicity is the foundation. It's that base pillar. And we talked about being a bit like a pagoda at one point in time. Mm. Um, so the first of these, bat, yeah, I, I've used the word paragalti, but in, in different contexts, I will use different words. So the the words that I tend to use um, in English for, for bat are discipline, strength, steadfastness, and paragalti. And 
what what BAT is really about is the it, achieving chelicity. The state has a coherence. It's not something that's um, it's not something that's that's disparate. The state of chelicity has a coherence, and BAT maintains that coherence. So it probably um, if I give so the reason I use all those different words is because bat doesn't mean any one of those words. They're kind of what I call flavor words. They're hinting words. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think bat is an easy enough word. It sounds like cricket bat, you know, bat um, or baseball bat. Mm. Um, and In Mongolian shamanism would, would would bat mean what it literally means? In Mongol, if that makes sense, and we in English have to use our flavor words to well, find our flavor of it. Of course, "bat" means what it literally means in Mongol because they're speaking in <laughs> Mongol. Yeah, but the question is, what does that mean in English? That's yeah. a different matter. Yeah, but d- I think you could t- change the question in a different way and say, would would "bat" the, the meaning of "bat" to a Mongolian shaman be the the same as the meaning of "bat" to a, a young cosmopolitan Mongol living in Ulaanbaatar? Uh, absolutely not. Mm. Um, because the, the, the young cosmopolitan Mongol living today in Ulaanbaatar will have a lot of influence, a lot of miasma that we, we collectively, the Westerners have heaped upon them through movies and all sorts of stuff, you know? Um, so the, uh, one of the, one of the, the phrases, one of the, the terms, um, that really helped me, um, with bat was, uh, something that's called Burej Shig Hurt Harate. Unfortunately, that's a bit of a mouthful and not that easy to remember. <laughs> but it it means, um, it, if you imagine uh, you're an eagle, a little bit of spirit animals here, you imagine you're an eagle and you're out hunting. You're quite high up in the sky and you are, you you need to find something to eat. Now, what you're trying to pick up on is movement on the ground. If you focus in, you know, eagles, everybody's probably where eagles have amazing vision. If you focus in on a particular point on the ground, the chances of a marmot or something else, a rabbit or whatever, running across that point of on the ground are virtually nil. Mm. So eagles instead use a, a, an expanded awareness they, they range over huge distances and they have a very expansive awareness. But just because it's expansive doesn't mean it's nebulous. It's not disciplined. It's not, um, it, it's not why would you say from, um, like, like, I don't know, um, a bit wet or, you know, woolly. It's nothing like that. It's, it's very sharp extended awareness. It's, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. It's the very, very disciplined. If something comes into that very extended awareness, it will be picked up on. It it may be the next meal, you know, for the for the eagles for the eagles young. So but in one sense has to do with how we use our senses. The eagle cannot possibly, you know, eagles have better eyes than we do. They cannot possibly process all of that information that's coming into its eyes on the baseline. It just can't possibly do that. It needs the baseline, the midline, and the top line all acting as one to deal with that. It takes the information, what I call raw, from nature. And through its spirit, it detects changes, you know, changes in the energy, changes in the spirit of the situation. It's effectively par part of it's made you know we talked about being like a tea bag it's made itself part of an expansive horizon a huge expansive horizon and it's not separate from that horizon it's part of it and it feels this is the weave the weave of energy you remember the shape of all shapes as they move together as one being it feels in its spirit the movements within that huge tapestry of nature and it knows when there is prey um it doesn't know on the baseline. It, it knows with the top line, the midline, and the baseline, the, the, the leaves, the trunk, and the roots of the tree all acting together as one. Mm. So this, this phrase, although it's a bit of a mouthful, when you're studying chelisti, it's always important that you're in that kind of a mode. 
So one of the things I think you mentioned, you know, practicing your shamanism uh, out looking over a lake. You, <laughs> yeah. you, that's, that's a really useful exercise for practicing, but um, it's, oh, I, I do it down by the sea um, mm. quite a lot. What I, what I tend to try to do is find a place to stand where I can't see any land. All I can see is water. It's okay if you can see land at a distance on the horizon or something like that, you know, if it's a lake or whatever. Yeah. But I can't see any land close up to me. I also, you know, we've talked about this before, I also want there to be no one around if that's achievable. Um, so, and I will practice my telicity there. And one of the things I will do is I will, I will take the spirit of Burad, the, the spirit of the eagle, and and try remember we said not try too hard otherwise you'll be you'll drag yourself down on the baseline try in a lightweight way to emulate this the the ability of the eagle to sense the whole tapestry and the allow the movements in the water the changes in the energy the changes in the spirit of the environment allow those movements to come into me completely unfiltered that is, I don't focus in on any particular wave or any particular thing that's happening out there on the water. I I allow that information to come into me, into my eyes, into my spirit, into my being. Very often, I'll in, in doing this, I'll adopt a posture with my, my palms upwards or my palms open. Um, that tends to help you. You know, it, it's like, you know, remember we talked about the little metal uh, representations of the spirit animals? Yeah. The um, on your costume, yeah. Oh, yeah. They, they represent spirit animals, and you kind of identify with them. So this posture is the same thing. It, of course, you can do chalisti. You can do it standing on your head if you want. You can do it in any position. But adopting postures like this with your your hands, palms upwards, your hands possibly spread wide. There are various different postures that I use. These postures obviously come from spirit dance for my spirit dance that I use in order to embody chalicity. But anybody can just stand with their feet slightly apart with their hands spread wide and their palms upwards. Looking out towards the horizon with with their eyes unfocused, allow the eyes to relax and they'll gen- generally unfocus. And if you want in that state, once you get used to it, you I'm not going to say what what will happen if you do that for an extended period of time, you keep practicing it. But to just all I would say is take it from me, very interesting things will happen. Another thing that we've talked about before the Amsco, once you get used to it, once you get good at that, you can also use that for, for observing your breathing in a lightweight kind of way and, and how that affects your spirit and how the waves affect your spirit. But this is a great exercise for for practicing bat, the bat component of chillicity. Okay, so we stood up. Damon, let's start with an overview of this concept. What is the miasma? Gosh, <laughs> that's about the trickiest question there is. Um, w- one of the things I think we've mentioned with the miasma is that our language uh, has been constructed as in such a way that it makes it very difficult for us to see the miasma. It kind of, uh, the, the, the nature and structure of the language that we use kind of points us away from it or faces us away from it. Um, and it's, this is more than just simply the language, not just having a word for it. I mean, we, we talked about, you know, the languages of animistic peoples, they tend to have a word for it. Mongols got Tiran, the, 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 the Siberian words, who have Ehru, uh, Japanese even has Hokori, Shiki, uh, and I, I believe in the Aboriginals called Ihwa or something like that. Um, so, but it's, this is more than just, um, the fact that, we we don't have a word for it. It's, so you're saying other cultures have have words for it and and, and go further than that have many words for it. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, when I say other cultures, you know, I'm talking about animistic, shamanistic cultures. Mm-hmm. I don't believe that other settled, civilized cultures have words for it. Um, I'm not an expert on French or German or anything like that, but you know, I have a, you're educated I'm, guess. I'm not a yeah, yeah. So educated guess. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, one of the, the, this, this, 
the construction of our language makes it very, very difficult to talk about. So one of the techniques I think that we mentioned that's been used to to explain shamanistic topics, shamanistic ideas, is the use of allegory and inference uh, historically. I mean, I think you mentioned the, the the wonderful work known as The Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz, um, an esoteric work um, that uses allegory in a big way um, to describe effectively the, the process of becoming a sham. Um, the um, those techniques we could use the, the, that particular work, which I I think is probably one of the most underrated works of of world literature. Um, it 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 relies on the fact that whoever wrote it, we, we're not entirely sure who that was. There are some there are some good ideas. Was a phenomenally clever person, um, a f- phenomenally clever in terms of the use of allegory. The technique that's worked better for me with with yourself and with other people who I um, who I've I've tried to help with shamanism and, and in terms of helping them to understand the miasma is is simply to give lots and lots of examples um, and what happens as as I give examples you know what we normally do we give practical examples involving doing things mm-hmm. uh, but on a podcast they're going to have to be descriptive baseline type of examples. But what happens is each one of the examples or each one of the descriptions or definitions, I have loads of definitions of the miasma, each one of the descriptions or definitions is not quite right. It's not the miasma, but what emerges out of that kind of activity is the the person concerned starts to see it. They start to see that underlying these things that are being presented to them or that, that you know, in, in normal shamanic training that they're engaging in, underlying those things is something else, some, something that's an impetus behind them. And that that thing that you can't put into words, you can't quite put it into words, is is the miasma. Um, so what, of, what I propose to do is get, just, just start randomly giving you some definitions of the miasma. The, the loss is much less of an issue for real shamans in real animistic communities. You know, you go back, I don't know, 20,000 years um, to a, to an animistic shamanistic community. Those guys have a little bit of a miasma. You know, we talked about stuff like, you know, um, rites of passage and, you know, uh, initiation ceremonies and things that people have to go through that keep their society in a certain order. It's like a miasma light, but it's nothing nothing compared to what we've got. So what I would say is, as, as settled civilized people learning shamanism, we have a much bigger problem with the miasma than, in inverted commas, your average shaman would for the vast majority of human history. Um, so let me, um, oh, I, and also the miasma, we've been working on it quite a long time. We've been working on this since, you know, since we invented agriculture. Um, or even slightly before that, you know, uh, we talked about pastoralism. So it's a lot stronger for yeah, us. It's, it's big, it's complex, its action is very, very subtle in many cases. Sometimes it's unsubtle, which we'll, we'll go into. Um, but it's, um, it, it is very, very strong for us. And one of the biggest, biggest difficulties... I think going back to the first podcast, one of the biggest, biggest difficulties for me as a member of settled society trying to understand the miasma is a big part of that miasma was used to be and possibly still is a big part of what I call me or what I call I. When I say the word I, I'm half referring to me and I'm half referring to a very large part of the miasma. So mm. so when something is so closely identified with you, um, it it makes it very very difficult to see. So uh, as we go on, you'll see I start giving historical examples of the miasma. The best way to put it, if if you're a true shaman, a legitimate shaman, uh, so let's take take a different kind of example. Um, so um, let's go with hatamch. Yeah, hatamch is um, where. The shaman, it means black weed. Uh, the shaman takes some kind of plant, uh, rolls it up in a pipe or some other kind of mechanism and smokes it. Yeah. Mm. The shaman is putting a complex set of chemicals into his body quite quickly through the lungs. 
Um, and um, there are various, again, this can be used to lubricate that slope. It can be used for the self-same purpose to lubricate that slope. It's the same kind of thing. There's so many substances that can affect you in, in into a non-ordinary state. Um, but what you find is if you went and did a survey, if you took, for instance, the whole of Asia, Siberia, and Mongolia, yeah, the whole of that area of the world, and you did a survey of how many different plants those guys are rolling up or, and putting in their pipe, you know, you could probably write a book <laughs> like an encyclopedia of plant species, which wouldn't be far off all the plant species that exist in the region, yeah? But the point is, any kind of organic chemicals that you put into your body will have an effect of some kind on you. Um, as long as they don't kill you, anything that has a, a, an effect on you, that has a, a non-ordinary effect on you, can act as that lubricant. Because in some ways, you need to be distracted from yourself to achieve... Modoch, you, you mm. need to be distracted from yourself, and that's the purpose they serve. They're like a, they'll just lubricate that, that transition from stage four to stage six. And it, as I come, as I come back to the, the legitimate shamanism, it doesn't matter whether that's a positive or negative effect. It doesn't matter whether it makes you feel rubbish or whether it makes you feel good or makes you feel nothing at all. It doesn't matter. If it if it serves that purpose of distracting you from yourself, then it's done its job. Do you follow me? And this is this is what I don't have. Um this is what I don't have people coming to me all the time and saying, which I wish I did. Um because, you know, if somebody came and says, uh, oh, I, I tried this plant, I threw up for a week, uh, I felt like I was dying. It was amazing. What a positive experience. <laughs> that I learned so much from, from the, the purpose of the shamanic technique. I, I achieved the purpose. I got it back. Yeah. That's what people don't say to me, you know, and it's, it's this this uh, judgment, you know, part of the miasma is these judgments. It's this judgment between what's positive and what's negative uh, that is the problem. We, we, you have we, to we set always all like to, judgments aside. Things are always a spread. They're always a, a sliding scale, aren't they? And we're, like we always say, we like to categorize things. So um, it's easy to fall into the trap, which I know I've read, you know, people talk about. And, you know, They were put here for a purpose. They were put here by God. You know, these are the kind of... The, the the gifts from aliens and all yeah there were to, to send it to send insects do lally so they don't eat the fungus <laughs> <laughs> but like you say <laughs> that like you say they 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 are spread from things that will kill you all the way through to the other side of it which are things that will send you do lally and give you these yeah, but the, the key point is the experience. things that just sent you do lally. Not- yeah, but the key point is the things for biological organisms across the board, the things that send you do lally are a lot cheaper to produce and easier to produce than the things it's that their, kill it's you. It's their defense mechanism. Exactly. And and why wouldn't you? It doesn't matter. If you send it the, the or if you send the animal do lally, the insect do lally or the human do lally. This, it's a good word, do lally, isn't it? It's a very shamanic word. If you send them do lally, do lally, <laughs> then <laughs> you've like achieved nuts. exactly nuts you've is another word. achieved <laughs> exactly the same effect as if you killed them stone dead. The only difference is you've saved a huge amount of energy that you can now use on other things like growing. Mm. Uh, something to say about that is that um, that the Part of the brain, or the part of the um, part of 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 the the um, the shaman that is um, that is uh, deals with smell. Um, it, the it is is the only part, really, in scientific terms, it's the only part of the brain with a very direct link to the limbic system. Um, as we've said before, the limbic system within the brain is is the part that is a part of the brain that's heavily associated with the the upper world, with the um, top line. Top line, yeah. and that's actually the only part of the brain that deals with sensory information with with a kind of what you would call a direct link 
to the limbic system. Other parts go via various routes to the limbic system. Um, and so smell is very, very important in shamanism. It's not people th- something that people think about, but s- s- smell is very, very important. And and it's it's important that the drum doesn't smell bad, yeah? Because mm. you're going to use the smell of the drum um, as a way of linking yourself into it. In a, in a very direct way. We're going to use the smell of the drum with the breathing. Obviously, you're breathing in and out of the back of the drum, the, the void space behind the membrane. You're breathing in and out of there, and the, the a good drum smells amazing. You know, it's a it's a mixture of hide and wood and, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's uh, a very and, natural smell. And it, it needs to be a smell that's... Oh, they all smell different, yeah? They all smell different. Yeah, we're not talking about any specifically... Uh, shaman drum specific smell here we're just talking about no, a, na- no, a no, natural all... woody earthy even, kind of smell even from the same person who makes it the, the two different drums can smell different yeah but it has to be a pleasant smell and so it's you know one of the ways you can show your experience if you if you're ever lucky enough to find a shop selling multiple shaman drums or you want to fake your experiences <laughs> you just smell them yeah it's, <laughs> it's something that shamans do when they're evaluating a drum they, they if, stick if you're in Mongolia, the they'll, they'll be quite impressed it's, with you then see it's, 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 it's not it's well it's, if yeah I, I just don't think it's going to the sort of thing that's going to impress your your new age friends in the west but <laughs> <laughs> you hold the drum you incline your head down in towards the drum, uh, in toward, into the upper back of the drum, so that you're breathing the you're breathing the air from inside the drum. Mm. Uh, do you breathe through your nose? Do you breathe through your mouth? Doesn't matter. Um, usually, this is not a very tiring exercise, so it's not like your heart's going to be heart rate's going to be going high or anything. So, so you can just breathe through your nose if you want. Um, I, I I tend to do a bit of both. That's just so I can get the smell of the drum. Um, what what I want is the drum and me not to be separate. I want it to be the same thing, not two different things. So I just very slightly, I personally very slightly open the mouth, and I'm sort of breathing 50-50 through the mouth and through the, 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 the nose. We, we think of smell, but actually taste and smell, you know, there's, there's some sort of linkage there, and it gives oh, yeah. a, a richer Definitely. interaction, you know. So the um the at that point you then turn on your chelicity. This is you starting the exercise. Ah. Now this is what we were talking about previously. If you're at stage two, which is what we're talking about, and you find it difficult to turn on your chelicity, that doesn't mean you need to work harder on your stage two. It need, means you need to work harder on your stage one. So if you can't sit there with your head inclined to the drum and just switch on your chelicity, then you know which episodes you need to be going back and listening to, seven, eight, and nine. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Because you to start on level two, to start on the AMSCA, you need to be able to switch chelicity on, you know, just like, like instantly or, or very, very quickly. Yeah, not thinking, not rationalizing in the moment, completely. Hang in the moment. Hanging no desire, no yeah. desire for what's coming next. No thought for what's gone in the past. Um, and just sit, just sit there or stand there and and turn your chest on and and breathe the drum. Take the smell. Take. The, the, you know, you can just breathe through your nose if it's if the 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 fifty fifty mouth and nose thing is. Take the take the smell and, and just like you know the remember Burad Shikhat Harate, you know, you're the eagle above the plane yeah. and and you take all of that in, you take it all equally, you take it yeah. Yeah. And the the you want no distinction between the oxygen, the air, the the smell, the drum, you, the environment. You want all of that distinction to fall away and you take it all equally. So that's the first part of Bukhin Hengereg. It's just to achieve chelicity in that position, holding the drum. Yeah, and we're not hitting the drum yet, are we? Yes. And I'm deliberately not going to tell you what's going to happen with the smell of the drum and all that kind of stuff, because that's for nature to feed back to you. It's not for me to tell you. It's for nature to feed back to you what is going to happen. Mm. When you've practiced this a few times and you're comfortable, um, that you can switch your chelicity on in that position, 
You don't, incidentally, when I say incline your head, I don't mean like at a 90 degree angle or you have to stretch down underneath something or something, you know. You'll, you'll see shamans quite used to, like, quite like you use quite large drums. Um, and, and that just makes your life easier. Um, you know, so th- there's no such thing as a drum that's too big, but there is such a thing as a drum that's too small. If mm. you are, um, if you're not experienced. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and also obviously the drum needs an open back. I should have mentioned that you definitely don't want to be using a drum that has a closed back. Yeah. Um, otherwise there won't be any air for you to be breathing out of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, it kind of goes without saying, but anyway, I probably should have said that. Um, so next stage. So you're in Chalisti. <clears throat> I remember ages ago in one of the podcasts, I said my, one of my guides, asked me to walk to a particular place without thinking. Yeah. And and I was questioning whether that's achievable. Now I'm going to ask you to do something without thinking. And you're probably going to be asking yourself whether that's achievable. Okay. Take it from me. It is. Yeah. Mm. So you might have to practice a bit, but it is. So what, what I want you to do is, when your breath changes, that is, you know, we breathe in and we breathe out. You know, you, you, if you want to call that yin and yang, then, you know, um, then fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we breathe in and we breathe out. So there's a tidal change in the breath. There's a point where it changes direction. The, the out breath is completed and the in breath is just starting to build. And there's a point where the in breath is completed and the out breath is starting to build. Now, the importance of chalicity here is that we have, as we've said, we have conscious control of our breathing. But for this technique, we don't want to use it. We want the breathing to be under the control, or if you're in scientific terms, we want your breathing to be under the control of the autonomic nervous system, not under conscious control. That's going to be very, very hard. It, that's, this is or this is a basic exercise, a basic technique. It's a very difficult technique for members of settled civilized societies because we're obsessed with thinking about things. But bottom line is, when that change happens, that's when the drum is struck. Uh, the 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 thing you're using to to strike the drum can just be your hand. So your other hand's also in the folded wings position. So you can see now that the folded wings position, the habstas position, is it comes from drumming. It's used without a drum, but it comes from drumming because that's the position you hold the drum in and the hand that strikes the drum. So it'd be one one arm inside the drum, one arm outside the drum, ready to strike. Exactly, exactly. And that is where the habtas position, although the drum isn't used in the tilling exercise, that's where the habtas position comes from in the first place. Um, It comes from drumming. So... You can use a beater to strike the drum as well. Some drums, you know, if you're buying one, it probably comes with a beater, so you might as well use it. Again, you want the hand that's 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 doing the, holding the beater to be in the as close as possible to that habitat position as possible. Well, if you're hitting it with your hand, that makes that dead easy. It can be in exactly that position, but you can hold the beater whatever's the closest to that you can you can achieve. Yeah. Um, so can we just reverse that a little bit back up to the um the when we're breathing and it becomes under the control of the autonomic nervous system. Um, no, when you when you breathe and you don't think about breathing, it is under the control of the autonomic nervous system. As okay. soon as you think about breathing, then your breath comes under conscious control. This is why t- this exercise, this technique does not work without chalisti because the chalisti is what allows you to leave it, leave the mm. breath under it's 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 if you like it's it's resting state the the control of it, it's not in terms of the control of, if to a sham it wouldn't be the control of the autonomic nervous system it would just be the way breathing normally is well i'm we, a bit worried we, now because you're saying um well i i think it's me that brought it up but one of the exercises to achieve uh bat or chalisti or a clear mind is to concentrate on the breath just breathing in no, and out and count them. No. So that's absolutely not. <laughs> no, that's not one of the that's not one of the exercises to achieve chalisti. That's a that's a trick that you can use. Mm. It's a trick that you can use to start off. Yeah. But yeah. if you need that trick by this stage, you shouldn't be starting out on stage two. You should be back on your Yeah. 
utility exercises. You definitely, at this stage, you're starting out at AMSCA. You need to be good enough at utility that you don't need to be counting sheep or anything. Yeah. Yeah. You, can, you should have enough feeling for utility, enough, enough. You should have uh, embraced it. You know, we said this is about embracing. You should have embraced utility to the extent that you do not need a count to stop yourself thinking. Yeah. If you need a count to stop yourself thinking, you're back to stage one. Um, and this is why I'm saying that, you know, I, I, I might have mentioned the importance of Chalisti <laughs> once or twice. Yeah. Um, but you can now see why it's important. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because the exercises are, are the, the techniques. There are techniques that are not exercises once you get to stage two. The techniques do not work unless you're in a state of Chalisti. They do not work. And that counting is not a state of Chalisti. It's a, it's a state of lightweight thinking. And we're trying to move from a state of, he- when we're learning stage one, we're, tr- we're using that. If we want to use that, there's other ways to do it. We're moving from a state of heavyweight thinking to lightweight thinking so that we can then progress to no thinking. And so, but but for stage two, Famsko, you have to be able to do chalisti without any thinking at all. No counting, no nothing. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's why I said when the breath changes, that's the, when the out breath stops and the in breath starts to build, or when the in breath stops and the out breath starts to build, that's when the, I said that's when the drum is struck. I didn't say that's when you strike the drum. Yes. And somebody's interested in shamanism. You cannot practice chelicity too much. Chelicity is your weapon against the miasma. So, so one of the one of the practices that that my teacher um, got me doing was simply to move through the woods in this state. Um, the, while maintaining the state, um, actually, he gave me a, um, a much easier exercise, which is simply to, because I sort of had discussion with him, and I didn't sort of believe that you could maintain chalisti while 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 really walking or, or maintaining normal functions, you know. So one of the early techniques I was I was given to practice was just simply to walk to some goal, probably about half a mile away, while maintaining chalicity. Now, this is just an everyday life, um, without you know, without thinking. How and I was like, I was like, how can I possibly get there without thinking? But it, it turns out you can. The, the, you, your your body, your, your spirit uh, are able to achieve this. You just you, you'd be quite surprised what you can achieve. And it actually goes further than that, which I'll come on to. A bit you like know, driving a car to a destination. Exactly, and you forget about your destination. You're very, right? very familiar with car driving. You do it a lot. Uh, I spend a lot of my my job keeps me on the road, and you you go on automatic, um, and you're not necessarily thinking about anything at all. Um, so I, I practiced this actively. Uh, this was one of the exercises, and then we would go out into the woods, and and I practiced this quite a lot. Um, we'll come on to some examples of the things that, that there were various variations on this, but you can imagine me walking through the woods on some hills. These are the Oak Hills in Scotland where, where I was walking through the woods, uh, very late at night. Um, preferably when it's overcast, you want it for this type of exercise, you want it to be as dark as possible. And I practiced this a lot and it was really, really interesting really um enlightening to be part of that place um to become part of this place over a period of time to start off with i wasn't very good at it but you know mm. over time my chelicity improved and, and i could just be you know people would say be one with the trees and with the ground and with the the air and the and the spirits and uh, at, after a, a year probably about a year or more's practice of this i I I really felt like I was I was doing it quite often. I really felt like I was um, part of that place. I, there was no difference between what was inside me and what was outside of me in these in these Michuan exercises, for want of a better word. And there was one occasion um, when I was walking through the woods and I saw a deer, and and. It was almost magical. It, it, that that sort of thing. People use that with, to shamanistic technique. They use that term magical. We need to be careful with that mm. um, because of Western views of what magic means. But anyway, I walked right up to this deer. I stood right next to it. It wasn't a big deer. It came up to about my chest, and I stood right next to it. Now I I don't know what 
what happened with this deer by literally, I'm literally standing with the side of my leg against its body, standing beside it, looking in the same direction that it was kind of looking, except deers, deers obviously have a wider field of view than, than me. Um, and it was there. And then, and then of course I thought, wow, this is amazing. The chalicity collapsed. I was dragged straight down to the baseline because I immediately thought, why is this possible? Why hasn't the deer run off? And sure enough, as soon as I thought that, the deer did run off. Um, yeah. but it was, it was an incredible experience. And actually, you know, we want to keep this, we want to keep the, this quite brief, but any one of these things. So there's an example of Michuan that's taking chalicity, the exercise of chalicity and extending it extending it further into a shamanistic exercise. And there's an example of one, simply moving through the, the woods now, quite a well-known... Well, it's interesting uh, what you were saying last yeah. last uh, episode uh, last episode about the animals, like how they would see you, because it's interesting to think about how what on earth the deer must have been going through yeah, to I, just stand there when you were there. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 my rationalization at the time, being a biologist, was that the deer, you know, deer have this freeze reaction because they, mm. they, they're quite well camouflaged. They stay still until they're sure that the person or the, the danger that may be approaching them is definitely approaching them in case it hasn't seen them. But in this case, I, I have to say there's no way that, that the deer couldn't have known I was there unless... It was this, you know, this effect. You've got to remember in those days, it's 30 years ago, also wasn't as experienced as mm. as I am today. I might have, if, I, if I'd been able to experience that today, I'd have probably been able to pick up on exactly what was going on there. But but these are not tame deer. These are not your tame deer in the park. These are proper wild deer who, I mean, I don't think many people knew there were deer in there, you know. Mm. Um, and it was quite interesting that I could actually touch with the side of my leg, this this deer, um, and it didn't notice me. But then, as soon as I thinking about start thinking about why is it not running away, then it ran away. I wouldn't vary that fast for real. Uh, that's yeah. just to give a demonstration of moving between these sounds. This, this, this alternating between the sounds makes different patterns of variations within your body. You don't want to do it as fast as I did it there because you won't have time to pick up on the responses. But mm. sometimes those transitions, in those transitions, there are responses that come back inside the transition that don't come back when you're using kind of a pure... So this is where the element of Tashal team can come in because we can start off... This, this is something which flows out and you can move between the vowels at random if you wanted to. Wherever, yeah, it's, wherever it's, they, it's, I wouldn't wherever say you it's at random. Um, I would say it's, it's as the spirit takes you. Yeah. And what you'll find is you, you'll find you want to move between the the vowels. Uh, you'll find that, you, well, I don't mean want to, you're thinking about it. I mean that naturally that will start occurring. Yeah. Um, but you know, normally I, I do this over quite a long period. You might, you might have, you know, I might be doing this for 10, 15 minutes. Doesn't really matter. You know, you just stop when you stop. Um, but it's not really, if you're doing it right, it's not tiring on your throat, like singing or, um, you know, even long periods of public speaking, you know, I, I stand up in front of people and speak, um, quite a bit for my job that can, that can tie your throat. This, this doesn't tie your throat out at all, because if you're doing it right, it doesn't, that's one of the ways you can tell if you're doing it for a long time and your throat's not getting tired, you know, you're doing it right. Cause that sounds coming right from down inside your chest It's not coming from, from inside your throat. Um, um, so that's that's the basics of it, and you know, when I say you know the level two start of this homie look start, um, start varying the start varying the technique in in terms of changing from one vowel sound to another, um, 
And then then there's a sort of um and so I've always said practice that for a while. I mean I practice this all the time. I love this thing. Uh, I practice it all the time. But I'm you know, like I say, I don't do it for entertainment. I'm not trying to get to the standard of the guys who attract a crowd in Mongolia, you know, because yeah, they, yeah. they do it in a kind of different musical set. It's not musical, but it's in an entertaining kind of way. So to make uh, this so to make this really clear, if someone was to practice this technique, you'd say start out with the single vowels first. Start out with the single vowels first, and then progress on to just just practice making sure you can make those sounds first. Yeah, yeah. So if if you want to know what the sounds are, I mean that the, they're they're done inside the chest, but that R E O U E, uh, you start practicing them in that order. Um, but if you want to hear the exact the, the what's the correct sound, then just pick up any tutorial on Japanese language episode one. Hopefully, it'll tell you how to pronounce the vowel sounds in Japanese, which are similar to the vowel sounds in in Mongol. Um, and they, but they'll they'll tell you them in the order a i u a o. Um, but that doesn't matter. It's the same sounds, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's that's kind of level one. Practice. I. I practice single sounds, uh, have done for years and years and years, don't feel any need to stop doing that. So it's not like you stop doing level one and then go into level two and vary them. It's just like, you know, you build out your understanding of what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, and then later on, you know, you can extend it. Also, how far you can extend that vibration through your body, you know. If you start getting it down into your legs and out into your arms, then you know you're doing it really well. You know, if you, if, if your legs and arms are feeling the vibrations coming through. I mean, genuinely, don't start imagining it. You know the imagination <laughs> yeah. trap. If yeah. you're genuinely getting those those vibrations through into your arms and legs, then you're doing it really well. Um, but inside your body cavity is not that difficult. Inside your upper body, you know, your lungs area, because it's quite hollow inside your lungs, and also your liver is quite spongy, spleen, that kind of area, getting the vibrations in there is easy. Getting it further afield takes a bit of work, but it can be done. Um so that's level, kind of level one and two of it. Um, so your whole body starts vibrating. Yeah, absolutely. If you can get it, your fingertips and toes, you're, you're done on level one. At least you're good as you need to be on it. You don't need to be any better than that, you know. Um, but that's this, the, I swear, I swear, this this is this is the root. This must be the roots and the origins of Om in India. I, yeah, I know I've absolutely. It, but, well, absolutely. This must be. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, things like um, Shikarai in Japan and, and all these same things, they all have the same kind of roots, you know. Mm. Um, so, Which is uh, shamanism. <laughs> well, it's shamanism and what shamanism became when we invented civilization, which is esotericism. Yeah. Which, you know, that's my definition of the word esotericism. Shamanism is a useful tool. It's even useful within a civilized, settled society it it just changes its form. It doesn't really change what it is fundamentally, but it changes its form for two reasons. One is the needs of people within civilized societies are somewhat different from hunter-gatherers. Mm. Um, and the other reason is, of course, for self-protection. You know, that's where, you know, a lot of this stuff, you know, is preserved inside secret societies and, uh, shall we say, um, branches of religions that are more, we've talked about before, branches of religions that are more shamanistic leaning. Mm. Um, but the, these things lead on and on, and there are, there are always all of these techniques that have layers and layers and layers. And so we said before, if you get really good at this type of technique, you can start building more layers on. If you if you particularly like it, I quite like this one, um, if you particularly like it. Um, so, for instance, you can use the drum for clearing. Um, so what I mean by that is, just, just let me grab my drum down. Um, you can use the drum for clearing, um, which is when you when you um, finish the the out breath. You know the sound. You just let it let it die. Uh, this is a demonstration. I'm not doing the technique here. Um, this is just a demonstration. I'm speeding it up. It would be much much uh, slower than this, but it'd be like. So basically, you're using the sound of the drum to clear your breath. So that is when your breath, 
the, your breath has an out wave and an in wave. Mm -hmm. When it's finished its out wave, the drum clears the way. Mm -hmm. So the vibrations of the drum pick up from the vibrations within the body and clear the way for the next start of vibrations to build. Thank you so much for listening, guys. I really hope you've enjoyed these um, previous moments from the podcast. Again, you can see the full episodes that I use to make this podcast in the information section on the podcast app or on this podcast episode. You should be able to read this in your favorite podcast app. You can uh, give us a, a nice review on that podcast app as well. This really helps us get our podcast in front of new people, which is, you know, always a good thing. Um, we will be back soon to continue our regular schedule episodes. Um, and as always, you can support us at patreon.com slash woven energy. And with that said, see you next time. <laughs>